Hello, Svetlana. Hello, Arne. Nice to see you again. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve pawns. <laughs> what is going on here today? Once again, we're going to be looking at a pawn structure. And uh, do you have a, an idea of what this one is called? It has a name? Yes, it does. Okay, let me think. Just like the previous lesson, we had the isolated pawn. This one also has a name. Okay. Jeremy? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, unfortunately, I, well, no, I don't know the name of that, actually. You might have heard before, but it's called the hanging pawns structure. When there's two pawns, huh. um, such as the one on c4 and on d4, and uh, they are not directly protecting each other, but at the same time, they're not really isolated. So this is an interesting one because it can be a really a strength and it can also be a weakness okay. because they cannot protect each other. But at the same time, they control a lot of the um, central squares. And this is a very, very common pawn structure. Uh, once again, depending on which openings you play, but most of the same ones as um, we've talked about for the isolated pawn also apply to this one. And because most of these hanging pawn structures happen from the isolated pawn structure in which, let's say, black in this case trades one of the pieces, let's say a knight or a bishop for the knight on c3, and then you recapture back with the pawn and you get this type of pawn structure. And then white is likely to just advance c3 to c4 later, and then we would get the position um, on the diagram. Do you, you don't get these positions too often, right? Certainly not. Now, what I'm wondering is if people are playing this same openings all over and over, which, yes, it's, it's true. I've seen uh, both, like the isolated pawn, which we had the last time. Hope you watched mm -hmm. it, by the way. If not, it's below in the links, of course. Also, of course, all the positions, just like the one you see here, are below the video in our news section. Also, all the links are in the description because uh, every couple of days there are new people watching only from YouTube do not check out the news site yet from Chessbase, so you can replay it, you can actively participate in these exercises. Uh, what I was wanting to ask is, what do you think do people prepare, uh, prefer who are playing those openings? An isolated pawn, the two hanging pawns, or do you think they take whatever happens? Or do you think there are uh, prefer preferable positions. I think some people have a have a preference, mm -hmm. especially with the isolated pawn. I find that a oh, lot of oh. people either really like playing with it and then there's other people who don't like playing with it. So I think it is a preference and that's kind of how you can choose your opening lines is if you start playing some sort of position and you notice that like you get these hanging pawn positions a lot and you just don't feel like you um you get uh, you get what you wanted from them, then you can al always switch up your lines and make sure that you don't get these positions too often. Mm -hmm. So I, th I do think that people have a preference, but usually you can't really run away from any of these pawn structures. Like you are going to have uh, isolated pawn structures, maybe even as the, as the side playing against it. So mm -hmm. just because you just because you choose lines, um, you know, you can play knight f3, g3 every every single game, and then you're not going to have any of these, you know, typical central setups. But uh, I do think that you probably do get them eventually, even maybe you play against them. Um, may, for example, in this hanging pawn structure, do you have a preference um, of which side do you think you would play with? Would you like to play with them or do you think you would like to play against them more? Yeah, this is a really, really, really good question, I have to say. And I'm thinking about it all the time already, even before you were asking me. So, mm -hmm. hmm, it is nice to have... No, I, I think I have no preference here because mm -hmm. it looks nice. I, I love connected pawns. I like them more than isolated pawns for, for a lot of reasons. It's just, I don't know, I think it's more aesthetic. Is there something like that? And it's nicer to play because you have more chances to uh, run run to the last row with them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, that is true. So in general, the way to evaluate them is 
generally white has better middle game prospects or not white, but just the side that has this pawn structure sure. from their point of view uh, because of the central control. So you see that there's control of all of these important squares Excellent. and also just more space for your pieces. But black, um, on the other hand, will try to aim for an end game. So mm -hmm. once the end game com uh, comes up, mm. then these pawns can be more of a weakness. So that is similar to the ideas with the isolated pawn structure, which we looked at last time. Mm -hmm. So in in particular, these uh, black is going to try to do a certain pawn break, maybe with b5 or with e5, so that they get separated or get pushed forward and uh, can be blockaded. Hmm. So if these pawns become blocked, then they can both become a weakness. And um, once one of them falls, then the second one falls. So it's really important not to uh, not to lose that coordination with them. So the plans for white, I'll do the same thing as I did um, last lesson where I'll say some of the typical plans and then we'll look at uh, at the games that um, will demonstrate them. So what some of white's plans here would be to create a king side attack. Most plans will include moves like knight here, bishop here, queen here, probably something something like this. And um, maybe even a rook transfer through the third rank somewhere. Now I understand right. what you're talking about, because I thought like, wait a second, how can you make a king attack if there are no pieces? But of course, you're talking about the general yeah. idea. Yes. Like I'm the not last talking time. about this Perfect. end game. This is just a, a diagram of, gotcha. uh, of what the pawn structure Absolutely. looks like. Absolutely. And that's great. Yes. Um, so another one. Another important one for white would be to sometimes play for this d5 idea. Mm. So that will not only open up your bishop, but can also give you give you a passed pawn. Yeah. If um, yeah, if, if that's that's in the cards in in your position. So yeah, just open up the files for the attack and um, gain even more control in the center. So that's white's plans. Um, you won't try to push it unless d5 is good for you tactically, mm -hmm. but otherwise you keep the pawns and enjoy the extra space. So the plans for for black will be to trade off some pieces. That's usually good to neutralize the attack that white will try to plan. Um, one of the main things, of course, will be to pressure these central pawns and to block them if it's possible. And uh, the pawn breaks that I've mentioned with b5 and e5 so that you make white commit to a decision um these breaks are not easy to carry out at all because um especially because the player um who plays these positions with white and knows these plans will try to prevent them so it's uh, not it might not be easy to carry them out if the opponent is really trying to putting all of their efforts into preventing them but they can be accomplished if if they can actually be accomplished then they generally tend to be really strong so it's really does there is really this line between these pawns being weak weak and these pawns being really strong so just like in some other pawn structures like we talked about with the isolated pawn mm -hmm. so we can go to an example for um, one of them, like in the previous one, one of them will be playing against the hanging pawns and one of them will be playing with the hanging pawns. Mm -hmm. So this first one will be, we will be playing with them. And I want to show for an example of how these positions can even, can even arise. So the most common one where I get them, for example, is the, is the Nimzo. Oh, the Nimzo, oops. So usually in these Nimzo structures, the C pawn, first of all, um, th there are some trades in the center that happen. So I'm just skipping over some of the opening moves. Mm -hmm. So at first you get this isolated pawn structure. Uh -huh. And then whenever the bishop does take on C3, as in this game, then you you will get these hanging pawns. And of course, you do... Uh, you you do sometimes prefer to to push it forward, which is usually what happens. You push it forward, and then the bishop comes out somewhere. So this is what happened in the game, and I'll get to the one where we actually get it, which is here. Hmm. So now we get this hanging pawn structure, 
And pro probably my question as white would be, how would you want to set up your pieces here? What do you think um, you would do? And how would you evaluate this position? Do you like it for white or do you like it more for black? Yeah, so I would um, probably push my rooks behind the pawns, maybe on C, maybe on D, to defend them a bit better, to push them forward a bit easier at one point, maybe. Um, I like the white bishop on the black squares on A3 a lot, because it has this beautiful line. Well, I think... That's absolutely nothing, but the line is beautiful. Absolutely, yes. yes. <laughs> And who knows, maybe it's going to be this one perfect line which will decide the game. Yeah. No, I think white has a little bit more initiative, but overall, I think it's quite equal. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would say that your plans are pretty much right. So the first thing that needs to be improved are the rooks. So they can go either c1 and d1 mm -hmm. or also alternatively e1 and d1. So you can choose, oh, okay. you can choose uh, what your future plans are depending on the position. Um, usually, it depends how much pressure is already put on the pawns. If you need to be defending them, then you can defend them with the rooks. But in this case, in the game, for example, rook e1 was played mm -hmm. so that uh, we want to keep the rook on this more or less open file and the other one can go to d1 and maybe try to push for d5 although this is possible with rooks on 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 any on both of these it's just a preference and what you think will be more um, useful in long term so that depends a bit on the opponent's setup as well and in terms of the evaluation i also think i like white better i do think that white has a slight edge and uh, that is because of the extra space and because the opponent hasn't yet proven that he's uh, attacking these pawns in an effective way or that he has any pawn breaks and i do like white's development better so your evaluation was pretty much was pretty much right i have to say i think in the last couple of months um because you and elizabeth pates of course who has like our kind of german show from from your smart moves um every now and then you're asking me how would you evaluate the position and uh, in the very beginning, which is we're talking about last year, because our shows are running since a while already, I was really bad. And I didn't even know what to orientate on and what to say. And I think in the last couple of weeks, I'm pretty spot on. I think there, yes, something you have, happened. You have been, yes, you have been good. We can even do a separate lesson on how to evaluate positions. I'd love like. that. Yeah, that's Let's a really that. important yeah. that's a really important topic and it's not an easy one to master at all. I mean, Definitely I feel not. like everyone uh, like that's a, that that's always a struggle even for grandmasters and the strongest players because you can't always you can't always know for sure, but you can definitely learn some general guidelines and mm -hmm. orient yourself better just like you said. So, yeah, we can definitely do that. So, in this um, in this structure, Black decided to put his his rook on rooks on e and d, so that maybe he's aiming for an e5 pawn break at some point. But problem is, I find the problem with e5 is that d5 is going to happen and That's attack good. the bishop, which is pretty. I mean, w which is also an important tempo, but these pawns cannot really be located immediately. They can be with knight c5 later, but uh, I think that this gives white just quite a lot more space, and it's not like these pawns suddenly became weak. They actually are still fine and gained even more space. Now d6 is even concerning, maybe not right away, but it is. it does look like a concern. Oh. So e5 doesn't seem like it works out, which is fairly important. And in case black goes for this b5 pawn break, then we can also decide where this rook goes, for example, on to c1, so that now b5 is no longer effective yeah. because yeah. this rook is That's even functioning very well on getting dangerous uh, to for losing a pawn for black sooner or later like that. So. Mm -hmm. so this is why you need to just always watch out which pawn breaks uh, are working and mm -hmm. which ones um, and which ones aren't, and you try to prevent them as much as possible when you're playing on the side with the hanging pawns. Um, 
So in the game, the bishop went to b2. So you can obviously tell that white is preparing d5 somewhere. Knight went to f8, repositioning itself to g6. Now, how would you continue for white? And what do you think uh, the rest of the of the plans would be? Oh boy. Okay, so let's think for a second. What would be a good deal? So yeah, my favorite bishop uh, on a3 who had this beautiful line is now on b2 where it has a terrible line. But of <laughs> course, that doesn't have to stay like this forever because at one point d4 will move to d5. Now the question is when or how do we prepare that or what do we do about all of that? Mm -hmm. So far, the black king is a little bit safe, so there's no king attack or shenanigans so far. I always thought about the knight going to g5, the queen to h3, something like that. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty much useless at the moment. Now, what would happen after the very weird-looking move d5? Let me calculate. e takes d5. Um... Yeah. Were you thinking about this one? Exactly. Yes. I guess you calculated that this doesn't work Ye because of this. Yes, I didn't. <laughs> but now I see. You can say you didn't. <laughs> but I do is... think that white black should be fairly safe here, um, even with such a pawn structure, because the king pawns it. were kind of gone now, and black is going to end up being up a pawn in this That's true. position and the king is relatively very safe. tempting to go for this though because yeah it's not so easy to see uh, anyway so yeah probably d5 is not yet good enough uh, well i would just put my a1 rook to d1 and maybe slowly but surely my bishop to d3 uh, maybe not then there's also very tempting now that I look at it. Since the knight went to f8 from black, how about going to e5 with the knight? Because at the moment it can really not be attacked very well, except with knight g6. That's what was played in the game. So you're slowly ah. getting to, to the more and more correct solution. Okay, it takes Rook a little while, one. but yeah. <laughs> Rook d1 made sense, I think, but it seems a slightly slow because now maybe black can also create some exactly, threat and yeah. tie your pieces a bit. Now there's knight e5, you have to consider the pawn on g2 yeah. hanging. So yeah, um, knight e5 is good. So that's a good way to activate your pieces. And it is important to understand when d5 is good for you and when it isn't. And this was one of the cases where it wasn't yet right. Mm -hmm. It's one of those moves that you, like, you're only going to play it once. So you need to time it right and not really rush with it because you will have chances uh, late, later or well you, you might not but it's not it's something that you better not to play at all than play and have it be wrong yes i agree and so, yeah the pawns yeah. yeah this is this is the difficult part about all of this sometimes in my opinion because i'm one of those people who just loves to push the pawns forward and mm -hmm. that's uh, sometimes a bit too too quick and here you have to just be careful because they cannot move back right oh, stupid that chess is, that is right why if the pawns could move back i feel like chess would be very different very different so in in this position black tries to um tries to do something on the long diagonal which is why the bishop came back to f1 yeah, danger so you see how white huh. really takes it quite slow so even though one of the main plans is an attack on the king side it doesn't have to be immediately on you know move 10 it yes. can you can improve your pieces a bit and um, that's how these positions are generally played um, usually the isolated pawns ones are i guess more tactical and a bit of a quicker attack because if huh. if black doesn't um, i mean if white doesn't do it then the pawn gets blockaded and the initiative dies out but here if the pawns aren't blockaded yet and there aren't threats of it, then it's a bit of a slower game. So here black played knight h4, maybe even tried to create a bit of an attack of their own. Um, and um, what would you play? How would you continue for white? I feel like we've been making slow moves for 
very long time. Yes, and that is why I would probably be very bad in positions like this if it's just this maneuvering back and forth and everything. So now I would like I would just go like, okay, that's enough. Let's let's get something going here. Um, but what? Hmm. <laughs> Bishop to a3 again. No, I'm just kidding. So how about we... Hmm. We I mean, still keep it slow, actually. Rather slow. Oh. Yeah. yeah, because I don't see anything very, like... I mean... I look, I'm look. i looking at queen e3. I like that move. Yeah, so we can start with rook d1 or whatever, but yeah. it, it doesn't really matter what we start with. But the initial plan that I wanted you to find was to maybe bring the queen yes. onto the king side. So you slowly build it up and uh, then the tactics can already start to appear. So bringing the queen to the king to the king side mm -hmm. was was one of the right plans. Um, okay, cool. That's good. But in the game, the player <gasps> um, who was I assume a grandmaster played bishop d3. And Enric Mecking. I'm not yes. sure if it's Brazil. It is. It looks or like Argentina. I just quickly have to Google it. So you can keep on. <laughs> it, it does. The flag is Brazil. So, ah, okay, okay. So, um, in so he played Bishop D three, and apparently it wasn't the best move because it allowed Knight H five with the idea of Knight of four, and then the Bishop suddenly will have to go back, and yeah. it cannot be really prevented. So. In the game, though, Black made a slight mistake back and played knight d7, after which we um, hmm. made this knight trade and Black's pieces became a bit uh, not coordinated. And this is, I think, probably the decisive moment where it finally came together and it's probably obvious what the move is now. Is it obvious what the move is? Ah, it's yeah, maybe it is just d5 it is just d5 because i said it was a decisive moment and what we've been waiting for all along do you see yes. the tactic after e takes d5 i'm well i have to think about um bishop taking g7 of course even simpler things are here no there's <laughs> so there uh is there a tactic there should be a tactic somewhere somewhere hmm there's a lot going on why don't there's I... a back rank yes very... so that's the that's the exclusive tip you're giving me right mm -hmm. it is a back rank check mate well i was looking at queen wait a second wait what but <laughs> what happens if we take the rook on e8? So what happens if we take the rook on e8? Exactly. You can actually start with queen h4, yes. I believe. Yes, yes, yes. This one, so, I mean, the only difference is that here they actually have the check on e3, which still doesn't oh, really work. But no. Okay. It so still doesn't, but if you start with queen h4, none of that is even it's necessary. It's a bit easier. Actually. That's a very beautiful yeah. tactic, yeah. So queen h4 is a nice tactic that you could calculate um, with this d5. And this is why this works really well. And once it works, then everything just comes together. And the game actually ended fairly soon. So they played um, bishop c2. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that on captures, do you see what white is going to do? I thought of queen d4, but maybe I'm wrong. So I do think that a lot of moves are actually yeah. maybe here. Not a lot of moves are good because you're going to lose your center. So you would rather probably win the rook oh. with bishop a4. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So a lot of tactics are in yes. these positions once you play d5. So um, when things start to open up, then it can get more tactical. Then hell and, broke loose. Nice. And it ended in... Um, a few more moves, not many at all. And uh, yeah, maybe here you can find a final tactic again. This one is really nice too. But White has been winning for quite a few moves already after d5. I think it was already fairly um, easy to play. But this one is a nice final tactic, but many other things win, of course. But I do think you can find this one. 
Okay, so now <clears throat> how to do this? I'm I'm a bit slow with tactics today. I have the feeling because yeah, give me a short moment for you at home, of course, too. Let's do a little tactical exercise here. Uh, no, that's not working. That's not working. That's not working. Whoop. Hmm. What the heck? I'm, I'm afraid I don't see it, Svetlana, before the show gets too long. It's, uh, it's basically, it, it's an attack. You know, whenever I tell you it's a tactic, it's you calculate checks, captures, and threats. Mm -hmm. Out of the captures, we only have the ones on G7 and H7. They don't work yet. So it has to be an attack. Yeah. And of course, if be... I gave it to you, it's probably a bit of a sacrifice. <laughs> Not really, but... <laughs> Oh boy. Ah, ah, okay. I think I finally found it now because of your hint. It's just rook on d7, right? Exactly. It's just yeah. the rook going to d7. And the point is that, well, the rook is aiming at g7. So it's not like the queen can just move away somewhere. Um, so if the queen takes, then we have queen h4 and the mate on h7 is unavoidable and these bishops are just so nice here and they're stronger than any rook that you can imagine uh, because yeah there's no defense against um, the h7 mate and in case of h6 we have a nice tactic yeah. with queen h6 and it's mate and black so, cannot even check which is beautiful because this bishop on c2 is taking away the space taking of care the of this yeah. this bishop is taking Very care nice. of this yeah so the, the bishops did end up being really strong so this is where the game ended. Um, and from this pawn structure, you could see that it was not really possible at any moment for Black to break through the, the hang, hanging pawns with any of his d5 or e5 ideas. Um, and this was because of White's good piece placement. Mm -hmm. So he tried to stop these plans and it worked out. The bishop pair really helped and um, it plays a really important role in a lot of these hanging pawn, pawns positions, especially okay. in the Nimza where they... Uh, where black is going to give up the bishop, the dark sword bishop for uh, for that uh, for that structure. So um, that's usually an important asset for the side playing with the hanging pawns, and they're very helpful in these positions. The more open they get, so here in this particular game, I think black probably underestimated the d5 pawn break, and it led to this favorable opening up of uh, of the position mm -hmm. and. Yeah, passive defense is usually unpleasant too, but uh, you know there's always uh, there were always ways to play differently for both sides, and uh, this one demonstrated more where White had the upper hand, so the side with the hanging pawns. So now we can see a game with um, with hanging which pawns is the opposite, and now we're, we're playing, playing against them. Against them, yeah. So uh, both of these the plans uh, can be can be used for for both so this one is going to be this yeah, against is really the this is so instructive sveta can i just say that you're a great teacher <laughs> thank you i honestly mean it like that you do oh, you you always have to you nice never to have see. to stop teaching okay let's <laughs> keep on so this one um we're still going to be white but playing against the pawns it didn't. It doesn't. It didn't have to be like that, but it just. Sure. Uh, it's just one of the games, and the. Um, I'm just trying to show many different openings where these can arise. You from. you often play those openings too yourself, right? I mean, I play all sorts of things. Yes. So, <laughs> it's, um, what what, I, I, what do you prefer, isolated or hanging pawns? I think I get hanging pawns more often than isolated. Huh. So I don't, at least as white, I don't have a repertoire where I get the isolated pawn too often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't get it too often. And I don't, I don't think I mind playing with it or against it, but I get hanging pawns more often than, I than the isolated one. But that could just be my openings. So this one came from 
a sort of a more strange opening, but as you can see, even Knight of Three G Three, something completely randomized, uh, it still gave uh, the hanging pawns position. So here we are with with this exact same pawn structure, mm -hmm. but we're playing against it now. So okay. here you can see where the pieces went. Um, the rest of the pieces will probably go queen c2, rook d1. So I feel like in, in this case, you don't really have too many options because as you can tell, you're, when you're playing against the hanging pawns, you have less control of the center, so you don't have as much space. So you even, I mean, at least here, doesn't even seem like you have too many places for your pieces, even if you have that choice. So I'll carry on a bit with how this game went. Mm -hmm. um, and just to demonstrate that these pawns are never really, it's never really great to push them if you're playing with them. If you ever play something like C4, you just allow, you just allow all of these squares to always be at your disposal. And of course we can also just take. Mm -hmm. And if you ever play D4, then this square becomes white's property and it's never good to play things like D4 in these lines, even though it looks like you're getting even more space, but that is not always the case. and. If you ever separate your hanging pawns and only one of them stays and becomes weak and isolated, then that's not really a good transformation of the hanging pawn structure. Don't ever do that. Well, not ever, but most often. Yeah, it's usually not a, a good transformation, but always depends on the situation. So the rooks are here. Um, white already developed uh, all of the pieces the best they could. So the next question is, what would be the next plan now that your pieces are all pretty much developed? What do you think should happen? Ah, beautiful. So this is one of many million typical end games where the position mm -hmm. is, yeah, you have actually evolved all your minor pieces. Even the rooks are there. Your king is safe. Now it is time for this one move. Probably this is also always like a position where people are thinking a bit longer right? To get a strategy, a plan or something. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, well, not always because they have played those openings many, many times. So maybe they already have their strategy in their head. But uh, if it would be for me, I would think for a long time. So, yeah, what we learned is we, at one point we have to consider breaking, may, having a break, breaking these pawns apart. And also here, again, once again, the question is, when is a good time for this? So now e4 or now b4 is a bit... Uh, b4 is not working at all, of course. But e4 is has this tactical options for black, so it doesn't look very tempting as well. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, that that's cannot one of be good. The, one of these tactics is this. And uh, you can even get your queen in trouble somehow. Ooh. And of course, they're going to win back the piece uh, yeah. on f3 and b3 is hanging. So you are right about e4 not being the right time for it. Okay, so what do we do instead? Now, I, I, I'm thinking about two quiet moves, which is... Uh, one is too quiet, but they, all, they both fulfill some kind of purpose. So h3 or e3. Mm -hmm. is something I am thinking of because uh, h3 blocks the knight on g4, gives the king a little bit more space and e3 just prevents d4 a little bit better after all. Maybe it weakens the white position too much. I like, I like uh, both of your suggestions. e3 is what was played in the game and okay. I think it's the best one. H3 also makes sense. I think white, black here can even try to go for still oh. um, trying to lure your queen in after something like this. Oh. And so that oh. this would be an interesting position. I don't think... Uh, interesting. I don't know if the tactics end up favoring uh, one side more or the other. It depends who calculates better here because a lot of things will be hanging. But... Um, 
H3. Unbelievable. How, how quickly this... I mean, I didn't even think about the consequences. Yes, you play H3, then the knight goes in, and out of a sudden you have a queen there, and there are tactics, and it's like, oh my god, I just played a quiet move. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, E3 is a bit safer, too, because, you know, now there's no... Um, now this whole diagonal to me looks yeah. better so that there's nothing on f2 and knight g4 isn't really dangerous because we're gonna kick it with h3 anyway mm -hmm. so e3 is one of the moves and also why it's really helpful is because it's preventing any knight jumps to d4 which could have been a possibility earlier if let's say you oh, ever okay. want to move this knight you will always have to consider knight d4 so e3 protects against mm -hmm. that and that's why it's a good move and you also found it so in the game continued like this yes queen that looks like a space for the queen that was my mm -hmm. initial thought too. we went here to create some threats hopefully not to get trapped yeah that's the other although problem, i would yeah. be scared um and now the opponent tries to attack one of the one of the weak pawns that we also have in our position yeah. which is b3 so my question is now how do you defend this pawn and what do you think uh, would be our next plan well defending is actually very difficult i mean defending with another piece i think there's almost no way except bringing the queen back but that's of course then that's not good for white because we just moved the queen so we're almost losing a bit of a tempo maybe so there's the other option to either cause a threat somewhere else or push the pawn maybe somewhere else. Hmm. Oh, or yeah, or we can create a little bit of a tactic by getting the rook to be one. That could work. Mm -hmm. Actually, that works. Mm -hmm. I think. I'd like. I would. So, I think I like rook to be one. Mm -hmm. So this is what was played in the game. Ah. So it's also a fairly good move. It's. A prophylactic move uh, preventing uh, the capture of course capturing will not be good because i do think that the queen can get in trouble and can later do this bishop g7 tactic where both the queen and the rook and also that bishop later get attacked and that's just uh, Give me exactly the what, yeah. what we were aiming for exactly so this is what was played in the game but actually the better move that i wanted you to find yeah. was before so it is before hmm it is before. So it was kind of, uh, the opponent was even it's asking tricky. for it by playing knight a5 and uh -huh. allowing this, removing one, one other defender. But the tactic here is rather complicated. Um, and it's that basically the only thing you have to calculate, the nice things about, about this is that you only have to calculate basically one line. What happens if they take me, right? So if the queen takes, that is it's true, rather... Yeah. It's rather obvious that the queen doesn't really belong here and it will get attacked. And the point is that the knight on a5 can, becomes a more of a weakness. So I don't know if the queen comes back somewhere, we're going to play rook b1 and eventually win this um, either attack or just get either win this knight or just get it in a very <clears throat> bad position. So this definitely is not it. Actually, I think we're even winning a piece. Bishop f2. Oh, okay. Bishop f1. Yeah, that looks very good. <laughs> Bishop yeah. f1 is not even necessary. Bishop f1, I think they play knight c4, but True. still. Huh. But still, I mean, you can just win the, the piece. Yeah. So we calculated queen b4, and it doesn't really look right to take it with the queen. It gets under a lot of attacks. So bishop b4, I think, is the more complicated one. <laughs> Do you see why this is uh, really good for white? Mm, it because it looks good. it looks quite interesting but i have to find out how and why and what Be of course there are tempting moves like bishop d4 we can also just yeah. immediately take yeah the reason is just that we have this really strong bishop and the queen and also the knight can join the attack and point is i mean it's really oh. hard to defend on g7 now this True. queen is tied to defending the bishop, so it, it's not like queen g6 is possible. No. And it's not like something like knight f6 is possible, because we're obviously just going to capture and capture That's here. So, so this bishop on g hmm. so we lure the bishop on to b4, so that now some of the pieces are tied and not able to defend on g7. So I think the only defensive try is really f6. <laughs> and of course, you can 
tell that this creates a lot of holes and you can just feel like there is definitely supposed to be compensation there and usually that intuition will be right so even though there's no like um, straight up mate here but the knight can come into those squares either on f5 or on g6 and it looks like a very good position to me if i was playing it i would probably even think i'm winning but yeah. i don't think it's that good it might just be a lot better it looks just really really good so the defense of black mm -hmm. has to be super super strong exactly so b4 was a very dynamic move and it was a good time to do it but <clears throat> It's okay. In the game, in the game, uh, the grandmaster didn't play it either. So you well, I just played better. as good as a grandmaster. Exactly. That's all that matters. But uh, yeah, before and these pawn breaks, like I mentioned, before B five and E five from the black side to here, they became E four and B four from the white side, mm -hmm. and they are always something to um, to look at. So the game continued a bit, and they made some more maneuvers. And here there was. This is the last chance to take over the initiative now. And this chance was taken by White. And you might already know the move because we've been talking about it for a while. Well, I see two moves again. I just have to figure out which one is the best one. Is it B4 or is it E4? Mm -hmm. But it, it looks as if yeah yeah it's b4 it has to be b4 it is b4 so i mean white did a lot of things black did a lot of things to um prepare themselves for e4 but b4 has been the one that just seems like uh the more prominent one in this game mm -hmm. because it worked out more uh more for us here particularly and the point is that once again the spawn cannot be taken um, because the bishop on b4 ends up hanging at the end of the day and we can win it in case the bishop goes there. In the game, knight b7 was played and you can already tell that after a move like that, you can kind of see that one of the sides took over the initiative. Mm -hmm. So point is black cannot really move d4, cannot really move c4. If they move c4, then it's just, uh, I mean, the d4 squares hours forever. And... That's not the way that you want to blockade your pawns. And so... And so this happened. The game went on and one of the pawns still became weak. And... Um, Ooh, knight c6. Some, some more point. trades were made. Knight c6 for sure at some point will be played. And after f5, there's another... There's a nice maneuver of improving one of the pieces. Um, but many moves yeah, are good. But that one moves. is nice. Do you see one? Um, Which one of our pieces doesn't do its I, best I, job? You didn't even have to tell me. <laughs> it is. I really saw it the second you you yeah. wanted to start. It is Bishop F one, which it looks is Bishop beautiful. F1. Looks really nice. I just find these kinds of moves kind of satisfying to yes. move the bishop to a better diagonal. That's a and, shock. And uh, many other moves were winning too. So. Um, that's just one of them. And the knight ended up going to c6 like you wanted. And uh, the uh, game soon ended because um, because I think Black's attack just failed. And a lot of his pieces are hanging at the same yeah, time. Yeah. And now it's not made threats, piece hanging, threats, mm -hmm. etc., etc. Yeah, so you see here we mm -hmm. were playing against the hanging pawns. And... Um, the opponents, uh, and I mean our pieces, were just uh, more coordinated than the opponents, and the b4 pawn break ended up being possible because of that. Um, there were, yeah, it's basically the, the opponent gave us multiple opportunities to carry out one of the pawn breaks, which is one of the main ideas here. Um, and uh, that is the essence of why one of the sides got the advantage over the other. Um, is because one of these pawn breaks was possible and um, one of the sides re outmaneuvered their pieces better than the opponent. So that's usually how these positions go. Um, so as you can see, these hanging pawns can be a, a good a asset when you're when you're using them right and when your pieces are well placed and they can also be more of a weakness and prone to these pawn breaks when when it's the other way around, when your pieces are not really well placed and the opponent's pieces are more coordinated. So I think these show 
plans for both of the sides here. And you can, as you can see, it can happen as both colors. It can happen from many different openings. And as long as you know some of the main plans and the spawn structure, they can apply in, in a lot of those cases. Lovely. Learned a lot again today. Uh, you can unshare this screen. This was, um, yeah, this was a great lecture. The last one there, really, it's like a, almost a part one and a part two. It was the last time we had the isolated pond. Now we have the hanging pond. Is there another pond structure like this, which is going... There, is many, there are many <laughs> pond structures. Most of them are going to be more specific to openings. Like yes. there's... Uh, you know, if you're a King's Indian player, maybe a King's Indian structure will be useful to you. If you're a Niter player, there's a Niter structure. So there's, of course, many different pawn structures. I think these two are the most, as general as it gets. The isolated pawn and the hanging pawns that can happen from many different openings and aren't really, yeah, they're the most general that I can think of. And with these words, we will see each other soon again. Looking forward to that. Thanks, Svetlana. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you for your comments. And thanks for enjoying our show so much. Show so much. We see each other soon. Bye-bye.